winner of a New York State Emmy for Best Political Program. This is a New York Now Special Edition, Governor Andrew Cuomo's 2014 State of the State Address. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of New York Now. We want to welcome in our viewers across the state on PBS, as well as our friends listening on New York State Public Radio. Great to have you with us. I'm Matt Ryan. And I'm Casey Seiler from the Times Union. Well, Governor Andrew Cuomo will be giving his fourth State of the State address today, actually in just a couple of minutes. Lawmakers, senators, state assembly members are pouring into the Empire State Plaza Convention Center to hear what the governor has to say. Dave, if we can take a live look down in Albany, you can see they're starting to fill up. Last five minutes, we've seen some of the assembly Republicans come in. Uh, many of the senators are up front already. Former Governor David Patterson, interestingly enough, uh, is in the second row. I don't know if he'll get a mention in the speech today, but uh, I guess that's something to look out for. Um, Casey, we don't want to give away too much that's going to be in the speech today. Well, the governor has already given away he has quite a lot. Quite a bit more than he has in recent years. Um, and a lot of the, the recent talk has been about the tax cuts that we could be seeing. Right, exactly. I mean, we've been talking really for almost uh, six weeks, I guess now, since the release of the, uh, of the recommendations from the second tax relief uh, commission. The two biggest, most high-profile elements there, at least for most people, will be the proposed two-year uh, property tax freeze right. if your municipality can stay within the, uh, the, the state spending cap of 2% or the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. And then the circuit breaker, which would uh, control, constrain the amount of your household income that could go to property taxes. We got even more details on that proposal earlier this week right. in, a, in a meeting with, uh, with the governor and many business leaders on Monday. Um, and what we learned there is that the circuit breaker would start taking over when the two-year freeze started to wane. So we're talking about kind of a multi-year plan here. And uh, the reaction was pretty good. It, obviously, many business leaders from across the state, uh, leaders from the Business Council, uh, North Country Chamber of Commerce, up and down the state, um, applauding the governor um, as, as this is a good move. And the Republicans came out and said this is something that they yeah, approve Dean of Yeah, Dean Skelos well. was very much in favor of it. Uh, of course, what you hear is that uh, assembly Democrats are certainly going to want their ask, as it were. One thing that they uh, that they were happy to see, which was not proposed by the commission, but almost immediately proposed by the governor, was a renter's credit right. that would essentially give uh, kind of half the benefit, benefit, as it were, to renters, of course, in New York City, which uh, makes up a large percentage of the Assembly right. Democratic Conference. Right, and of course, uh, Governor Cuomo has been paying a lot of attention to upstate New York, which he says needs it the most uh, from an economic standpoint. But yeah, he, he put that in there to kind of satisfy um, his colleagues in the Assembly downstate. Well, and also the governor, uh, it's going to be interesting to see in this speech how the governor deals with the kind of new administration in New York City. Uh, the governor and Bill de Blasio, who is in the Capitol and received an almost rock star welcome from a lot of elected officials uh, today when he showed up at the, at the Capitol. He attended uh, Speaker Silver's uh, breakfast, mm -hmm. annual breakfast uh, gathering. Right. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how the governor deals with, for example, the question of universal pre-K, which the governor says he wants. It's, of course, the problem of how to pay for it mm -hmm. that, uh, that has him at loggerheads, uh, or at least uh, potentially could put him at loggerheads with uh, with Bill de Blasio. Right, and I was not. He was also at a press conference today with the uh, members of the uh, Senate IDC, the Independent Democrats. Jeff Klein has closely aligned himself mm -hmm. um, with uh, Mr. De Blasio, and I guess from what I'm hearing, I wasn't at the the, the press conference, but uh, it seems like he's still intent on raising taxes on the wealthy in New York City, no matter what uh, Andrew Cuomo proposes in the budget. Does that, does that seem fair? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, fair, fair to the wealthy. I, I wish, I <laughs> wish I were. In the situation to uh, to be able to judge, but um, it's yes, it's fair to say that that that's that's really the big divide between him and De Blasio is how to fund universal pre-K in the city. Senate uh, Republicans, of course, are dead set against it. Mm -hmm. The IDC, which of course is doing their best to kind of keep their progressive friends and supporters in their camp and not, for example, supporting primary opponents are so far lockstep behind de Blasio. And in fact, Jeff Klein and, uh, and the rest of the IDC have offered a, a very progressive uh, agenda of their own for the 2014 session, which includes an expansion of public housing, uh, a, a large expansion of, uh, of uh, medical leave, family leave mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for New Yorkers. Uh, so it, the, that tension, the tension between 
the sort of New York's rather moderate Republicans and the kind of newly resurgent downstate progressives is going to be one of the big political narratives this year. And as a reminder to our viewers, the Senate is controlled by a coalition of four what they call independent Democrats and the Senate GOP conference. Uh, Correct. It's very delicate and this is an election year um, and that could change drastically. So it's interesting to see Klein, um, Senator Klein from the Bronx align himself so closely uh, with de Blasio. Well, and you're already seeing uh, just in the Capitol today for the first time almost since the end of session, I saw many of the women's advocates who had been at the Capitol seemingly almost daily uh, during uh, the 2013 session pushing for the women's equality agenda. Many of them are back. They say that they uh, expect a push for those, uh, for the, the 10 points of the uh, women's equality agenda right. again. As mm -hmm. you may recall, nine of them sailed through both houses. Yes. The assembly passed the omnibus 10-part bill that included a codification of uh, abortion rights protections. That was a non-starter right. in the Senate. Uh, Senate Leader Dean Skelis said it would not go through, and it didn't go through. Right. And it didn't go through in large part because there weren't 32 votes right. for it. And uh, the argument can be made whether or not that is a more effective political issue to have rather than have it be something that really was actually going to come to fruition last year. What's for sure is that abortion rights groups like NARAL Pro-Choice are going to really put Republicans' feet to the fire and the IDC's collective feet to the fire as well this year. What else can we expect in this speech? We, uh, there were some other uh, leaks this week, some more help from upstate, it seems like, uh, something that, that the governor is really concentrating on here in an election year. Well, the other, the other big part of the tax plan, of course, was reducing corporate taxes and upstate for manufacturers reducing those corporate taxes to zero. The governor uh, wants, to, wants to continue the push that's on with the rollout of the, uh, the Startup New York plan, the tax-free plan that's going to be based around uh, public educational institutions and a couple of, of private settings as well. He's hoping, he's hoping to bring manufacturing back upstate, including potentially international um, uh, manufacturing as sure. well. You are watching and listening to live coverage here on your local PBS station and local New York State public radio station. We are awaiting the beginning of Governor Andrew Cuomo's fourth state of the state. There you get a live look for those of us watching on PBS at the Empire State Convention Center in Albany. The seats are almost filled right now, which is a, a sure sign that we'll be starting here shortly. And Casey, let's go back to last year, um, which was really the tipping point for a lot of people with Governor Cuomo uh, as far as the support for him. He came out with the New York Safe Act and that turned off a, a lot of people. There was a, some memorable sound bites from, from that 2013 speech. There you see Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy on stage. We'll throw it down there into just a second. But Casey, uh, last year it was, it was a pivotal moment for Governor Cuomo and, yeah. and for, the, a lot, for a lot of people. The dramatic high point of uh, last year's speech was of course the you don't, no one needs right, 10, 10 bullets to kill a deer. So we'll see if uh, we get any more memorable sound bites uh, this year. And there's uh, A.G. Eric Schneiderman. A.G. Eric Schneiderman, Casey, the uh, Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy who you see on our screen there. The other question is, will he be back on the ticket with Andrew Cuomo in the fall of yep. 2014. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about that. There was, of course, a, a fair degree of controversy, I think it's fair to say, over his uh, flirtation with a job with the Rochester Business Alliance, which is sort of the Chamber of Commerce organization out there. There were many reports, including in my paper, that he was, in fact, offered the job and, uh, right. and then uh, was ready to accept it, but then potentially came some intervention from the second floor, we should say, and that job was uh, was no longer on the table for Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy. And in years past, Casey, we've seen the governor actually bring legislative leaders up on the stage with him. Back in 2011, he actually had Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, who you see right there being introduced, speak before the governor, as well as Dean Skellis, who was the, uh, the sole leader of the Senate back then. And this year, he brings up Assembly Minority Leader Brian Kolb, um, who's the minority leader by two to one, still brings him up on stage along with the, the minority leader in the Senate, uh, Andrea Stewart-Cousins from the Westchester Yonkers area. And there's, and there's Jeff, Jeff Klein. Klein of the IDC. Yeah, and uh, one other thing to uh, look forward to is what the humorous PowerPoint reference to the legislative <laughs> leaders will be this year. I think, uh, wasn't it, haven't we seen uh, ships that pass in the night? Uh, rafting, yes. and I forget what the other uh, one. I, the baby, it? the baby Andrew Cuomo. That's that right, and baby Sheldon Silver. Yes, yes, that's great. I hope they've got something to match that. And here's the governor. Here's the governor being introduced by his lieutenant governor, Bob Duffy. He'll take a seat 
momentarily. You are listening to and watching New York Now's coverage of the 2014 State of the State. I'm Matt Ryan along with Casey Seiler from the Times Union. We're going to send it down right now to the Empire State Convention Center in Albany for Andrew Cuomo's State of the State. Now, everybody, please rise and remain standing as we welcome the New York National Guard, Color Guard. Major Denise Sherman will lead us all in a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please take your seats. I would now like to welcome Rabbi Shai Schachter from Knesset, Israel, and Far Rockaway to deliver a blessing. Rabbi? We gather today on this very special occasion to celebrate the completion of the year that has passed and welcome the new year to come. We appreciate the blessings that God has allowed us to help bring about, and as substantial as they may be, we feel as our job is never done. We join together to celebrate the successes and accomplishments of Governor Andrew Cuomo and thank him for all that he has invested and improved in our state, making it more just and equal one for all. We pray that God, the master and creator of the world, grant us the fortitude to raise the level of meaningful life for all in this state. I, along with so many others, thank God for giving us the strength to progress and rebuild after the devastating Hurricane Sandy just over one year ago. We know oh so well how blessed we are by God for providing us a leader the likes of Governor Cuomo who helped us pull through these difficult times, and for this and more, we are forever grateful. I pray that he bestow wisdom upon the Honorable Governor Andrew Cuomo and the legislative leaders, enabling them to guide our state in a most outstandingly effective manner. May we all be blessed with a happy and healthy, industrious and most productive new year. Thank you and amen. Thank you, Rabbi. It's now my pleasure to introduce a member of the Assembly, the Honorable Kareem Kamara, senior pastor at the Abundant Life Church in Brooklyn, to deliver the invocation. Reverend. Creator and sustainer of all that is or will ever be, accept our thanks for this day and all its blessings, its opportunities, and its challenges. Bless this gathering, bless our leaders, Governor Andrew Cuomo, Senator Skelos and Klein, Senator Stuart Cousins, Speaker Silver, Assemblyman Cole, Attorney General Schneiderman, Comptroller DiNapoli. We ask that you bless all leaders here, all elected officials, all community individuals, anyone who's here with the best interests of the state in mind. Bless and guide and direct this legislative session, its leaders, and our actions. We pray for strength and guidance for each day on the session calendar as it comes, for each day's duties, for each day's problems. 
grant that each of us may feel responsibility to our constituents, our community, our state, and our country, and that we are challenged to give our best always. Let us commit to fighting to injustice not only in our particular corner, but wherever it's observed. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Let us commit to owning our own actions and decisions. As Rabbi, Rabbi Abraham Heschel reminded us, few are guilty, but all are responsible. Let us commit to what has been the American way, a dedication to the most vulnerable in society. As Pope Francis reminded us, a way has to be found to enable everyone to benefit from the fruits of the earth, and not simply to close the gap between the affluent and those who must be satisfied with the crumbs falling from the table, but above all, to satisfy the demands of justice, fairness, and respect for every human being. As we gather here today as members of state government, we pray that we are mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens and to our community, that we are mindful of exerting our efforts upon which the future generation can build and that which makes the world a better place. But above all things, we pray that we are mindful of those enduring values that galvanize us, liberty, equality, and justice. Thank you, Reverend. Now to begin our event, please join me in recognizing the other legislative leaders that are in attendance today. First, Majority Leader of the New York State Assembly, the Honorable Joseph Morelli. <laughs> Majority Leader, is the Assembly present? Senate Governor Duffy, I'm pleased to report the Assembly is organized, ready to proceed with business. Looking forward to the Governor's agenda. Thank you, Leader. I'd like to now recognize the State Senate Deputy Majority Leader, the Honorable Thomas Libis. Deputy Majority Leader, is the Senate present? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. The Senate is present. With great anticipation, we await the Governor's address. Thank you, Deputy Majority Leader. Now, I want to acknowledge some of our special guests who are here today. Please join me in acknowledging, first of all, uh, the former statewide officials who are here with us today. First of all, please welcome former Governor of the State of New York, Governor David A. Patterson. Next, please welcome the former controller of the state of New York, the Honorable H. Carl McCall. Today, we're also honored to be joined by the U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary Sean Donovan. I'd also like to welcome all the local officials from across the state that took time to join us here today. Uh, we have some new members to our ranks. I would like to extend a warm welcome to four of our newly elected mayors across the state, starting out west. Uh, from my hometown, Mayor Lovely Warren of the city of Rochester. You are watching and listening to Governor Cuomo's State of the State Address here on PBS and New York State Public Radio. Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy speaking right now. Andrew Cuomo is expected to... Take the microphone here in just a few minutes. And last but not least, the mayor of the city of New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio. We also are, are very proud to have four of our newly elected county executives today. County Executive Edwin Day of Rockland County. Next, please welcome County Executive Vince Horgan from Chautauqua County. Next, County Executive Steve Newhouse from Orange County. And County Executive Matt Ossenfort from Montgomery County. It gives me great pleasure to recognize members of the governor's family who have joined us today. First, Mariah Kennedy Cuomo. And also, please welcome Sandra Lee, who joined us today.
Finally, I am very pleased to welcome the citizens of our state who came to join us today from all four corners of New York State to listen to Governor Cuomo's fourth State of State Address. I want to thank you all for attending, for taking the time to come here. And those of you that face very tough weather conditions, we especially thank you. And today up on the stage, we have flags from all of the state's 62 counties representing all of you. <laughs> New York State has suffered nine major natural disasters in the last three years. She has torn up roads in the North Country, washed away houses in the Catskills, flooded factories in the Southern Tier, and left millions of people in the dark in New York City and Long Island. Throughout it all, first responders from every corner of the state and from every level of government responded to the call of duty. These are men and women who run towards danger when every fiber in our bodies tells us to run the other way. Today, we are joined by 125 first responders who have courageously served our country and our state during all these tragedies. On behalf of Governor Cuomo, I first want to thank each and every one of them for their great service to our state and country, and thank you for your bravery and your courage and all you've done for all of us. And I would ask them to please stand. I would also ask all, everybody in attendance if you join me in recognizing these incredibly brave individuals who have served us so well, led by General Murphy in the front row and 125 first responders. Please join me in a round of applause. for your service. You make New York State very, very proud. Thank you. I'm now pleased to introduce Abby Albright, a fifth grade math teacher from the Cortland and Large City School District and one of our master teachers. Abby. Hello. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Duffy. It is an honor to have this opportunity to address my fellow New Yorkers. Ever since I was young, I wanted to be a teacher. Today, I teach eighth grade math at Cortland and Large City School District. Our job is to give young New Yorkers the best shot at a bright future. I look at my students and I see future CEOs, doctors, engineers, and even governors. The beauty of teaching is that you learn as much as you teach. New York State understands that concept and values that passion. Governor Cuomo announced the Master Teachers Program in last year's State of the State. Earlier this year, I was chosen to be a master teacher. Thanks to this program, the state gives me financial incentives for taking the time to learn with my fellow educators how we can all perform better in the classroom. This makes me a better teacher for all my students. Each one of the master teachers brings a unique perspective, but all of us share one simple passion giving our students a great education. The Master Teacher Program is just one of the many initiatives the state has launched over the last three years to invest in and dramatically improve public education. From teacher evaluations to pre-K and community schools to billions of dollars in new funding, the state is investing more in our classrooms and students than ever before. I am a mother to three boys three New York students who deserve nothing less than state-of-the-art and first-rate teachers. I can already see the change in their classroom and mine, and there is no doubt that all New York students will reap the benefits of teachers who are more engaged and better equipped. That is how we prepare the next generation of global citizens right here in New York. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Abby. I'm now proud to introduce Pat Radke, who's the president of the UAW Local 897 from the city of Buffalo. Pat. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Duffany. Uh, it is an honor for the UAW, my membership, and myself to be here today. I have lived in New York and worked in New York for 43 years. 
I'm the proud president of UAW Local 897 in Hamburg. My family resides in Western New York. My, my wife, <coughs> I raise my w children with, along with my wife in Western New York. <laughs> I love you, dear. <clears throat> to say that our area has fallen on hard times is an understatement. For years, I watched as my friends lost their jobs and struggled to pay their bills. I wonder if or when I would be next. It is a difficult feeling to explain the stress and the fear. Factories were closing down, unemployment rates skyrocketing, and people continued to leave in search of opportunity. I grew up in Lackawanna in the shadow of Bethlehem Steel, which employed tens of thousands of people. Now all those jobs are gone. In fact, I work in the only remaining standalone Ford stamping plant. And this is in an area which was rich with manufacturing jobs just 20 years ago. All the others have closed up and packed up and moved down the road. And through that time, <clears throat> our state government was nowhere to be found. I think it's clear, standing here today, that the tide has turned. And there is no better example of this progress than the Ford stamping plant just outside Buffalo where I work. About six weeks ago, the governor came into our plant to announce that Ford was going to invest $150 million in my facility, solidifying the factories. <laughs> solidifying the factory's long-term presence in the region and creating and retaining 990 full-time, good-paying, permanent jobs in our community. Governor Cuomo was there supporting the men and women in organized labor, standing up for our region once again. On the day that the governor came to our plant, 990 families were giving something you can't put a price tag on, and that is peace of mind. The Ford investment is just the latest surge of companies relocating to Western New York. They all see the activity in the region, and they want to be part of it. In what used to be a desolate, abandoned neighborhoods, you now see new businesses opening their doors, shovels in the ground, and more job opportunities than ever before. And people are moving back to Western New York because they know they can, be <clears throat> they can start a business, raise a family, and prosper. Even the site of the old Bethlehem steel plant that I grew up next to is coming back to life. And I look around and read the news. I see what's happening not only in Buffalo, it's spreading across the state. Ford decided to stay because they knew they would never find a better, more dedicated workforce, no matter where they went. They decided to stay because, like so many other companies investing in New York, they got the support and the partnership they need from our state government. <clears throat> this is a new state government that is constantly working to help us reach our potential because we are the backbone of New York's economy and its communities. And finally, we have a state government that recognizes all these needs. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce the man who has transformed our state government, the governor of the great state of New York, the greatest state in the union, Mr. Andrew Cuomo. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year to all of you. First, let's start by giving Pat a big round of applause for coming up and sharing his story. And Abby, also, thank you very much, and thank you for what you do teaching our students. Let's give Abby a round of applause. To the great master of ceremonies for today, an outstanding lieutenant governor, a great public servant,
He's been all over the state for three years. Nobody works harder or better than Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy. Let's give him a round of applause. Our great controller, former member of the great New York State Legislature, Tom DiNapoli, pleasure to be with you. <laughs> Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, who's doing a fantastic job for the State of New York, pleasure to be with you, General. <laughs> they were introduced already, but I can't uh, overemphasize the cooperation, the partnership of the legislative leaders. Uh, we've had a great three years. It wouldn't have happened if these individuals didn't do what they did individually and work together the way they did. Uh, and as a personal point of uh, privilege, I want to thank them for the kindness that they've shown me. Senate Leader Dean Skelos, Speaker Sheldon Silver, <laughs> Independent Leader Jeff Klein. We're also pleased to be joined by Assembly, Assembly Minority Leader Brian Kolb and Senate Minority Leader Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins. Pleasure to be with you. <laughs> to the members of the court, Chief Judge, thank you. Members of the court, thank you very much for being with us and thank you for your good service. To Governor David Patterson, number 55, let's give him another round of applause. Thank him for his good service. And again, Happy New Year to all of you. I think it's a, a year that is going to be a banner year for the state of New York. And that's what I'd like to speak to you about today, where we go in 2014. But there's an old saying that before, that you don't really know where you're going until you know where you've been. And we should start this year with a look back when we first joined in this hall three years ago. The state of New York was in trouble. The New York state government was literally a joke at that time on late night TV. It was about scandals, it was about indictments, it was about dysfunction. But even worse, this was not about a momentary lapse. These were fundamental structural problems that had been going on and growing for a long time and were now coming home to roost. It started with the simple fact that the state spent too much money. The state spent more money than the people in the state earned. And it did it not just for one or two years, but it literally did it for over 60 years. And if you spend a lot, then you're going to have to tax a lot. And we taxed a lot. And as a result, our taxes had become the highest in the nation. And we were paying a price for the high taxes. People and businesses were leaving the state. On top of that, for decades, Albany had become a poster child for gridlock. Long before Washington, D.C. put gridlock on the front pages, the story in Albany was gridlock. And it always happened at the time of the budget. Why? Because that's where the money is. And it was late over a 30-year period, 23 years. We had a late budget. Average late budget, 50 days. New York State had lost its way. We were spending more money, and we were actually getting less results for the people who we were supposed to be serving in the first place. Because the government had become more concerned with special interests and with their contributions than the people and their problems. And these governmental failures were not in an abstract. It wasn't just in a government course. They had real negative effects, and the people of the state were suffering. 852,000 people unemployed, the largest number since the Great Depression. Property taxes, the highest in the country. Upstate New York was in free fall. We were on the precipice of an abyss. The state's future was hanging in the balance, literally. And the cynics and the naysayers said that we were too far gone and there was no way we were going to turn the ship of state around. But we knew that fortune favors the bold and that New Yorkers, if anyone, know how to beat the odds. 
and we set our sights high. We said we were going to restore economic opportunity to the state of New York. We said we were going to replace dysfunction with results, that we were going to put people before politics, and we were going to reestablish New York as the progressive leader of the nation once again. We stopped talking and we started doing. And in three years, my friends, you have reversed decades of decline and made dramatic and undeniable progress. For the first time in modern political history, for the first time in modern political history, the state has real fiscal discipline. We've held spending to 2%. For the first time in 40 years, Spending is below the rate of inflation and below the rate of growth of personal income. And because we spent less, we could tax less, and we did. Every New Yorker pays less income taxes today than the day they did three years ago when we started this journey. We now have the middle, lowest middle class tax rate in over 60 years. And we don't just have lower tax rates. We have a fairer tax code. We went from a flat tax in the state of New York where everyone paid the same income rate, regardless of how much income they earned, to at a graduated rate which is much more fair for the people of the state. After 20 years of trying, we passed the state's first property tax cap. And for the first time in 30 years, we broke the gridlock that had plagued Albany, and we passed three on-time budgets in a row. After years of false starts, we instituted a real teacher evaluation process that focuses on performance rather than merely growing the bureaucracy. After 30 years of talking, we passed casino gaming, which will bring a new economic future to parts of this state that have been suffering for too long. <laughs> After decades of conflicts, we renewed our spirit of partnership with the Indian nations across this state. And let's take a moment to recognize the nation representative, Ray Halbreder from the Oneida Nation of New York, Ron LaFrance of the St. Regis Mohawk, Beverly Cook of St. Regis Mohawk, and Michael Kimmelberg of the Seneca Nation. Thank you, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. We said we would make New York safer, and we did. We passed common sense gun reform with the New York SAFE Act. We established an all crimes DNA database. We enacted tough new texting while driving laws. We said we would make New York healthier, and we did. We provided health insurance to more than 265,000 New Yorkers through our health exchange, and it worked, and it worked well. We said we would make New York cleaner, and we did, opening a $1 billion green bank, adding more money to the Environmental Protection Fund. We said we'd make New York smarter, and we did. We expanded full-day pre-K, incentivized performance through master teachers, and launched SUNY and CUNY 2020. We said we would make New York fairer, and we did. We raised the minimum wage, we closed juvenile justice facilities, we opened the Justice Center, and we passed marriage equality. <laughs> the proof is in the pudding, and the arrows are pointing up. We've added 380,000 new private sector jobs since 2010. New York is now ranked number two in the nation in number of jobs created since the recession. And today, as we sit here, we have more private sector jobs in the state of New York than ever before in the history of the state of New York.
Exports are up 15 percent. Our ratings are up from all three agencies at a time when the rating agencies are downgrading governments all across this country. All three rating agencies have a positive outlook for the state of New York. And because jobs and exports and our ratings are up, unemployment is down in every region of the state of New York. We have given New Yorkers a government that costs less, taxes less, and actually does more for the people who are in need. The progress is not just in the numbers. You can feel it in every region in our state. In the lower Hudson, they'll talk about the new New York Bridge that is rising after 20 years of talking. In Utica, they'll talk to you about the new future of nanotechnology. Even the two regions of the state that needed the most help three years ago, Western New York and the North Country, they are different places in just three years. Western New York is in the midst of an exciting transition. The Republic Steel plant that closed in 1984, which was the symbol of the low point of Buffalo, today is the same site where Riverbend is rising, a new R&D clean energy plant that's going to provide hundreds of jobs in Buffalo. There are even sightings in the buffalo sky of a species long thought to be extinct in Buffalo. Cranes are flying once again in the buffalo sky. Buffalo News editorial from this past New Year's Eve. Couldn't have said it any better. In Buffalo, for decades, the norm has been a glum acceptance that we live in a second-rate city with a fourth-rate economy and that there was nothing to do about it but moan. Over the course of a year or so, the poll has lifted. Western New Yorkers started to regain confidence in their city and the direction in which it was headed. It qualifies as the story of the year, maybe the, the story of the decade. Congratulations to Mayor Byron Brown. Congratulations to County Executive Poland Cars, to Howard Zemski, to Satish Tripathi, who have done great work. In the North Country is the same thing. The North Country was long ignored by Albany. But there is a new economic life. The Trudeau Institute is an emerging world-class biotech hub. There's going to be a new hotel in Saranac Lake. Bombardier's state-of-the-art rail car facility in Plattsburgh is going great guns. The North Country has a new future. And let's give them a round of applause for their turnaround. <laughs> Three years ago, the capital was literally and figuratively crumbling. Today, it is shining brighter than it has in decades. You cut that ribbon on that new capital, and you should be proud. We did what we said we would do. And as elected officials, there's no statement that makes you prouder to stay, say when you can look at the people of this state and say we did what we said we would do. We changed the direction of this state for the better, and we have. Congratulations to all of you, and let's take a moment and recognize once again Senate Majority Coalition Leader Dean Skelos, Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, and Senate Leader Jeff Klein. Please stand, gentlemen, so we can give you a round of applause. Now, we have much more to do. But we are energized by a new strength, a new pride, and a new confidence. And let us build on that record of success. For New York State, job one is jobs. Our statewide job growth strategy starts with a top-down reducing tax theory. Our financial restructuring of the state has actually paid off. When we were here three years ago, we were looking at a $10 billion deficit. It was historic and it made us all quake in our boots. I know it did me. 
we have gone from a $10 billion deficit to a $2 billion surplus in just three short years. This year, this year, within the 2% spending cap, we can increase our investments in education, health care, economic development, and still provide more tax relief. We impaneled a bipartisan Pataki McCall Tax Relief Commission, which did good work. They made the basic point that the state has no economic future as the tax capital of the nation. People move and businesses flee. So let's continue to make our state more competitive. Let's cut more burdensome business taxes. New York State's corporate tax rate is currently 7.1 percent. Let's cut it to 6.5 percent, which would be the lowest corporate rate since 1968, and really send a strong signal to business saying this is a different day and we're doing it a different way. Let's pass a manufacturer's tax credit for 20 percent of the firm's property tax liability. New York is one of only 15 states with an estate tax, and our exemption levels are among the lowest and our rates are among the highest. Let's eliminate the move to die tax where people literally leave our state, move to another state to do estate planning. We propose raising New York's estate tax threshold and lowering the rate to put it in line with other states. We also need a renter's tax credit to help New Yorkers afford the ever-increasing housing costs that they're experiencing. And a circuit breaker, which is a property tax credit to help low- and middle-income New Yorkers based on their ability to pay. The Pataki-McCall Commission recommended a freeze on property taxes for two years to help homeowners and to incentivize local governments to reduce costs. A property tax freeze, but only if two important conditions. Year one, the locality stays within the 2 percent cap, and in year two, the locality takes concrete steps to reduce their costs through shared services and or consolidation. Because while we're reducing taxes, my friends, we also have to tackle a major structural problem, which is the proliferation and expense of local governments. The main tax burden in New York State is not the income tax. It is the property tax. We raise about 40 billion dollars per year from the income tax, we raise $50 billion from the property tax. And that is the tax that you'll hear New Yorkers complaining about from one end, one end of this state to the other. As a matter of fact, no matter how you look at it, New Yorkers don't just pay a high property tax, they pay the highest property tax in the United States of America. Literally, the highest property tax in the country is in Westchester County in absolute dollars. When you look at by percentage of home value, the highest costs are in upstate New York, literally in the country. So why are our property taxes so high? Because we have too many local governments and we've had them for too long. 10,500 local governments. These are towns, villages, fire district, water district, library, sewer district, one district, just to count the other districts in case you missed the district. <laughs> we have a proliferation of government that is ex exceedingly expensive and costly. Now, the state has been very aggressive in trying to alleviate the burden from local governments. We've assumed more local costs than the state government has ever done in modern political history. We assume that $1.2 billion cost of the Medicaid growth. We are funding $700 million in aid to localities. The Tier 6 pension reforms makes a major difference for local governments. We also offered local governments that are functionally insolvent financial assistance if they work without financial 
Restructuring Board. When I was Attorney General, first of all, I looked much younger when I was Attorney General. <laughs> when I was Attorney General, we actually passed a law that made consolidations easier for local governments. Since we passed that law, how many local governments have actually consolidated? Tom Libis gets it, too. It's time to stop making excuses. It is time to start making progress. If the locality wants the state property tax credit, it must perform. We've seen that linking state funding to performance works. Remember when we did the teacher evaluations the first year and we asked every district to complete teacher evaluations, we basically had no compliance. Year two, we linked the teacher evaluation system with the 4% increase in education, and we had near unanimous approval. We believe linking the assistance to performance is going to make a difference. And there is a ray of hope, because there are local leaders who are stepping up to the plate. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize the great Onondaga County Executive Joni Mahoney and the Mayor of Syracuse, Stephanie Miner, who are working together They are working together to see if they can achieve consolidation and shared services between Onondaga County and the city of Syracuse. We wish them well, and we hope other leaders follow their example, because that's exactly the right course. Thank you very much, County Executive, and thank you, Mayor. Second, we need to eliminate the regulatory barriers. We all agree, eliminate any regulatory barriers that we can that are, barrier, that are barriers to business growth. We've talked about it for many, many years. The Senate has held hearings. The Assembly has held hearings. Let's join together, create a joint commission, do it together, and let's pledge to stop talking about it and actually get it done this session. Drop the regulatory barriers that are stopping businesses from growing in this state. Third, we have to rebuild our infrastructure because we need a 21st century infrastructure to build on. Our airports are the gateways to New York for nearly 50 million people each year. Vice President Biden was here yesterday talking about how countries all around the globe are developing their airports with sophistication and, and hospitality suites. Even our nation is doing a good job overall in updating its airports and upgrading its airports. Unfortunately, the state of New York has fallen behind. LaGuardia Airport is ranked as the worst airport in America, believe it or not. That is a disgrace, my friends, and it is unacceptable, and it's going to change. We need to modernize JFK and LaGuardia. We've talked about it for too long. We will assume management responsibility from the Port Authority for construction at JFK and LaGuardia airports. We'll do what we did with the Tappan Zee Bridge. We're going to step in, stop talking about it, get the government to work, and we're going to redevelop those airports the way they should have been redeveloped many, many years ago and make us proud of that gateway once again. We must expedite the building of our energy superhighway. We still have a problem getting low-cost, excess, clean, renewable power up from power downstate from upstate, which is costing ratepayers $600 million a year. It can take up to two years, believe it or not, to get a new transmission project approved. And some of the proposed projects are causing concerns by expanding into local communities. Let's incentivize smart projects that locate within state-owned or existing transmission right-of-ways so they're not interfering or spreading into local communities. And let's offer those smart projects an expedited approval process that will cut the time from two years to 10 months 
if they do it smart. It's a win-win for upstate, which needs the economic growth, and it's, it's rate-payer savings for downstate New York. Second part of our economic development strategy has been a bottom-up approach through regional collaborations. Our regional economic development councils are working. They are the core of our jobs agenda. The proof is in the pudding, and it is all across the state. Let's do another round of the REDCs, a fourth round, because let's build on what is working in this state, and working with local communities on a regional basis is working, and we have to do more of it. <laughs> Last year, we launched Startup New York. There's nothing like it in this country. It makes New York the least expensive place in the United States to locate a business. It took our reputation of high taxes and anti-business and flipped it 180 degrees with passing just one program. Businesses nationwide are already uh, expressing interest in Startup New York. We want to take it to the next step and let's start to globally market Startup New York because I believe we can literally have companies coming from overseas to this state because of the Startup New York program and if we market it, that will happen. We want to hold an international conference at the Javits Center to introduce executives from overseas to the Startup New York and all the assets and beauty that this state has to offer. I also want to recognize at this time Mr. John Mack, who is the former CEO and chairman of the board at Morgan Stanley. He is a great financial mind. He's a leader in the business community. And he has John Mack has been generous in volunteering to help the state on financial matters writ large, but also to help m market the uh, Startup New York program. And his credibility is a tremendous asset when we're marketing New York and we're marketing Startup New York. Let's give him another round of applause, Mr. John Mack. Thank you very much. Three years ago, we said we would focus on upstate New York. Why? Because the upstate economy lags not just the New York City economy, not just the rest of New York State, but it lags nationwide. Literally, over a 10-year period, when the nation was growing 9 percent, upstate New York was growing at just about half the rate of the country. And this is a problem, frankly, my friends, that we ignored for too long. And Upstate New York then entered a downward cycle where they lost economic power, which caused a depopulation of the area, which caused the loss of political power, which caused the loss of governmental help, which then caused more economic power to be lost. And upstate New York has been in that cycle, not for one year, not for two years, for 10, 20, 30 years. The notable exception was, frankly, here in the Capital District and nanoscale, where the state made a significant contribution uh, and with some real talent from Dr. Elaine Calleros, literally generated an entire industry. But it shows what the state could do when the state invested. But the state, besides the Capital District, in many ways forgot the rest of upstate New York, and we said we were going to change that and reverse it, and we did, and it's already paying dividends, and we want to do it again, and we want to start it with taxes. Let's go to the upstate manufacturers, because we need manufacturing jobs in upstate New York, and let's cut the corporate tax rate in upstate New York to zero all across upstate New York, period. Why? Because you can't beat zero, my friends, and it is a competition. We've taken our tourism efforts to a new level. So far, we invested $40 million on our marketing campaign, and our investment 
is paying off. Tourism spending is up year to year $4 billion, believe it or not. It is, it's twice the national rate of growth. Tourism jobs increased by 25,000, which is also twice the national rate of growth. We want to redouble our tourism efforts. We need the activity upstate New York. And with upstate New York, seeing is believing. If they visit, they visit again. If they visit, they enjoy it. It's just a matter of exposure, because once they come, they're hooked. We propose one-stop shop licensing, a New York State adventure license to help promote tourism, where you can go to one portal, you go to the, the Department of Motor Vehicles, and you can apply for all your licenses, and they'll be literally presented on your Department of Motor Vehicle license, rather than having to deal with a lot of agencies and carry a lot of paper. That happens to be our Commissioner of Department of Motor Vehicles, Barbara Fiala, who's doing a good job. It's a pleasure to recognize her. I did not know that Barbara was a trapper and a muzzle loader, however, but <laughs> even better. Let's give her another round of applause because she's a trapper and a muzzle loader. On this quest, the state will open up 50. Uh, previously closed state-owned land, so there'll be more opportunities for hunting, fishing, boating for both in-state people and tourists who come from out of state. We're going to launch a whole new signage campaign on our roads, promoting the assets of New York, organized into three campaigns, the Path Through History campaign, the I Love New York attraction campaign, and the Taste of New York Food and Beverages. You'll see these signs on the roads literally over the next few days. And these campaigns link online to all those attractions in that particular area, all along the thruway and all along major routes. Uh, the goal is to get people who are on the roads, off the roads, into communities, and fostering and promoting the economy of the state of New York. Last year, I invited Last year, I invited some of you to participate in the Adirondack Challenge at this speech at this time. Most of you accepted the challenge. We had the new guys who came proudly. We had the tough guys who came. We had Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid who actually made a guest appearance. We had the Thelma and Louise's raft which was a highly competitive one. We had the odd couple raft. <laughs> and we had the city slicker raft. We had the master rafters, or at least people who thought they were master rafters. Oh, that's embarrassing, Larry. But two important people were missing. And we put out an all points bulletin because <laughs> we were very concerned when they weren't there. We were expected them to be there. We were hoping that they would be there. We were sure they were there. And therefore, when they weren't there, we were very concerned and did what we were expected to do. We were later happy when we found out at least they were OK. <laughs> In a new spirit of bipartisanship and cooperation, taking it to new heights, Speaker Sheldon Silver and Senate Leader Dean Skelos. <laughs> Since we know that something pressing must have come up because they would never just on a random fluke miss a pressing competition. We are giving them a second chance and a second challenge this year. It's the 2014 Bassmaster Classic. It's the Governor's Challenge. It's August 21st. It'll be hold, held on Owasco Lake. I once again 
hope that Dean Skelos and, and Sheldon Silver and Jeff Klein are there for the competition. It will be all in good sport, but I hope they're there. You're all invited, and we'll have some fun, and we'll promote some tourism. I'll see you there. Our casino plan is already generating great interest. We said we believed it would, and it is. Our challenge now is to make casinos a reality, make it happen, make it happen fast, and make it happen correctly. Our current plan is March 2014 for the RFP to go out, bids come back in June, and we hope to make the selections in early fall. The casinos are gonna be run by the Gaming Commission, uh, and the chairman of the Gaming Commission, which is an appointment by me, is going to be Mr. Mark Yearin, who is the president of Hobart and William Smith Colleges. He is a great academic. He's former director of the Peace Corps. Uh, he's a model of civic engagement. He's done a great job uh, at the university, and it's a pleasure to have him, and we thank him for taking the time to take on this important obligation. Mr. Mark Yearin, thank you very much. Our targeted investments in public-private sector partnerships are working. We want to keep the momentum going with a second round of the Yogurt Summit, the Regional Beer, Wine, and Spirits Summit, the Tourism Summit, the Path Through History Summit. We want to add this year a summit, uh, agricultural summit, to help connect upstate producers to downstate consumers. I believe there's a very interesting market that could be developed, and we want to do our best. The Buffalo Billion is working. It really is working better than I think anyone could have anticipated. We want to take the next step and locate the Genomic Medicine Center in Western New York. The geno Genomic Medicine is the next frontier in modern medicine, and we believe we can lead the way. We want to create a Genomic Medicine Network partnership among UB and the Medical Corridor CNSE, IT, the New York City Genome Center. It's creating hundreds of jobs and an entirely new industry for Western New York. So let's get at it. In the North Country, the pro proposed Route 98 could reduce travel time and speed up commerce. Let's see if we can make it a reality. We've been talking about it for years. Let's get DOT to undertake a study and see if we can make this project happen. That's our focus on upstate New York. You can see it's comprehensive from tax credits to tourism to casinos to targeted investments to Buffalo and Route 98. It's been an important priority. It's paying dividends, and we're going to keep it going. But whether it's upstate or downstate, the best long-term economic development strategy is to have the best education system in the world, period. And that's our focus. We are in the midst of an education reinvention, replacing a 1950s bureaucracy with a 2020 performance organization. We formed the New New York Re Education Reform Commission headed by Chairman Dick Parsons. They have done extraordinary work. They have called for full day pre-K, extending school days, and for performance pay. The next step now in our journey is to reinvent our classrooms with new technology. We must transform our classrooms from the classrooms of yesterday to the classrooms of tomorrow. Experts said that technology would be the great equalizer. They said that the information superhighway would be a democratizer of education. And that's correct, and they are right, if you were on the information superhighway. But if you're not on the information superhighway, it could leave you behind at 100 miles per hour. And there are great disparities in education. At some schools, there are children who are on the internet. Some schools, they don't even have a basketball net. 
There are some schools where they have sophisticated new computer systems on the first grade. There are some schools where the most sophisticated piece of electronic equipment is the metal detector that you walk through on the way to the classroom. And that is just wrong in the state of New York. We can do better, we must do better, we will do better. Let's invest in the future. Let's reimagine our classrooms for the next generation. Let's have the smartest classrooms in the nation because our children deserve nothing less than the best. Let's go to the people of this state. Let's be bold. Let's go to them in November. Let's put on the ballot a bond referendum for the Smart Schools Initiative. Let's invest $2 billion in providing the technology of tomorrow today to bring our classrooms up to speed. What does new technology mean? It means every child learns at his or her own pace. Students get the skills they need to succeed in the 21st century economy, at access to advanced courses, Parents and teachers can communicate, and teachers can access the assistance and training they need. It's not going to be about growing the bureaucracy. It's going to be about helping students. It's going to be used for equipment such as laptop, desktops, tablets, infrastructure upgrades, high-speed broadband. There will be strict eligibility on the use of funds, and each district must submit a technology plan for approval by the state. And while we remake our classrooms for tomorrow, we must get young minds engaged as early as possible. In 2013, in the State of the State, we called for expanded full-day pre-K. The Assembly has long championed the same. It's time, New York to, it's time for New York State to have universal full-day pre-K statewide. Quality teachers are the backbone of our education system. And let's recognize and thank Master Teacher, A.B. Albright, who did the introduction for her introduction today and for being here. Thank you again, A.B. We're going to continue the transformation of our system and reward performance by creating a teacher excellence fund. It's going to be the first statewide teacher performance bonus program that actually rewards performance for teachers and incentivizes teachers who perform well. Teachers who are rated highly effective on their evaluations, which is the highest statewide rank, would be eligible to receive $20,000 as a bonus in performance pay which is on average 27% of their salaries. You want teachers who can perform and who do perform, then incentivize performance with a performance bonus and pay them like the professionals they are. When it comes to higher education, our SUNY 2020 and CUNY 2020 reinvestment and capital programs are working. We want to continue them for a second round. The future of the economy is in STEM jobs. We should be incentivizing our education system to fill those openings. We want to provide to the top 10 percent of high school graduates full scholarships to any SUNY or CUNY school if they pursue a math or science career and agree to work in the state of New York for five years. After Storm Sandy, Irene, and Lee, the New York State as we know it faces a different reality. We had more storms this year in the central part of the state. And for government officials, it's an entirely new challenge. Uh, county executives, governors, mayors were accustomed to dealing with the matters of cities and states, but this this really is a, a challenge that no one can be fully prepared for. Luckily, we have extraordinary 
uh, elected officials in the state of New York, and we have extraordinary county executives who I've had the pleasure to work with through these storms. And I'd like to, at this time, recognize Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone, Nassau County Executive Ed Mangano, Oneida County Executive Anthony Presenti, for really working above and beyond the call of duty and doing extraordinary work for the people of their county. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. After what we went through, we literally have to reimagine New York because all the rules, all the theories are out the window. And it, it's now through, what, through the experiences reimagining how New York should be built because extreme weather in many ways changes everything. First, we want to start by installing the nation's most advanced weather detection system here in the state of New York because early detection will literally save lives and we haven't been getting the correct information early enough. And the state will embark on putting in the most sophisticated weather detection device uh, ever installed by a state. We're going to establish the nation's first college on emergency preparedness and homeland security. Believe it or not, there is no such college. There are colleges that offer courses in the area. But we're going to establish the nation's first college dedicated solely to emergency preparedness and homeland security because I believe this is a field that's only going to grow. Unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. And we want this college right here in the state of New York training our people and training others from around the country. We recruited, <laughs> we've recruited Ray Kelly to be a special advisor to the state in setting up this school. Ray Kelly has phenomenal experience in terrorism and homeland security and we're honored to have him. We'll create a citizen responder corps to train our own citizens. We want to train 100,000 citizens in the state of New York by year's end so people know how to provide services in their own home for their own family, and then they can be helpful on their own block and on their own community. We have to totally harden our transit system. When we built the New York City transit system, we didn't envision floods that could fill the subway system. The tunnels are open, the subway entrances are all open. And in a situation like Sandy, that just created tremendous flooding. We now have to reimagine a subway system where you can close all those openings. And we're going through that with a $5 billion massive plan. That picture is of an experimental inflatable plug that is inflated to plug a subway tunnel to keep the water out. We will open a new spur for Metro North Railroad to provide more resiliency and direct access to Penn Station, which will also at the same time build four new stations to bring transit options to the Bronx. We will repair and replace over 100 bridges in upstate New York with new state-of-the-art bridges that are designed to maintain uh, their structural integrity given the floods that we're dealing with. The totality of our reconstruction program is over 1,000 projects costing over $16 billion. It is the largest reconstruction program the state has ever undertaken, believe it or not. And it is thanks to our federal partners, it's thanks to the congressional delegation that helped us get a $60 billion supplemental after Hurricane Sandy, so we have the funding to do it. And it is also thanks to an extraordinary gentleman, an extraordinary New Yorker, who is the HUD secretary, but he was a New Yorker first. And he has been a great partner to New York. He's the person who led the federal government interagency task force. He's here with us. Let's give him a big round of applause and thank Sean Donovan for his partnership.
But, my friends, even with all that, we still have more to do. We have to make New York healthier. Research suggests that medical marijuana can help manage the pain and treatment of cancer and other serious illnesses. 20 states have already started to use it. We'll establish a program allowing up to 20 hospitals to prescribe medical marijuana, and we will monitor the program to evaluate the effectiveness and the feasibility of a medical marijuana system. New York, <laughs> New York also means justice for all. Governor Patterson increased the MWBE contracts to 10 percent, the goal for MWBE contracts, and we applaud him for that. In 2011, we set an ambitious MWBE goal, doubling that to 20 percent. I'm pleased to tell you that we actually beat it this year and have exceeded the goal of 20 percent. This year, we will focus on certifying more companies, more MWBE companies, so we can even create more jobs. There are other New Yorkers who we can help in this way. Disabled veterans showed us their loyalty. We must show them our loyalty. Let's set a goal of 5 percent in awarding of state contracts to disabled veterans owned small businesses. We will host a summit this spring to find ways to make this goal a reality. Our New, York work, our New York Youth Works program that we started last year has helped 13 inner city youth find work. Unfortunately, the unemployment rate is still 40 percent for inner city youth. There is still more to do. We want to extend the New York Works program, extend the length of the tax credits, to businesses to create more jobs and provide job training through a job linkage program. Let's get these young people working. Let's get them a future. <laughs> Affordable housing is a crisis. Homelessness is growing. We're going to increase our commitment by investing an additional $100 million in building affordable housing. This country said in 1949, as a goal, a decent home and a suitable living environment for every American family. That was 1949. It still hasn't become a reality. In 2014, every New Yorker deserves a safe, clean, decent place to live. And let's make it a priority for this state government by putting $100 million more into affordable housing. We have good news in the criminal justice front. The good news is crime is down and our prisons have fewer people in them. We are reducing the madness of an incarceration society and ending a system of unnecessary human and financial waste. And now we have eliminated 5,500 prison beds. The bad news, you should applaud for that. The bad news is there's a revolving door where 40 percent of the people who are released from prison wind up back in prison. We need to provide the reentry su support, support and services like job training and access to key services to ease that transition into mainstream society. Reduced, reducing recidivism means less crime. It means safer communities. It means fewer taxpayer dollars spent on incarceration. Let's stop the ro revolving door once and for all. Let's create a reentry council that brings together all the state resources and coordinate, coordinates them so we make those transitions effective and lasting. <laughs> Our juvenile justice laws are outdated. Under New York state law, 16 and 17 year olds can be tried and charged as adults. Only one other state in the nation does that. It's the state of North Carolina. It's not right. It's not fair. We must raise the age. Let's form a commission on youth, public safety, and justice, and let's get it done this year.
Last year, we proposed a 10-point Women's Equality Act agenda. Why? Because discrimination against women is very much alive and well. Since last year, nothing has changed. Discrimination against women still exists. It's just been another year when government has failed to act on behalf of women. Stop playing politics with women's rights and pass the Women's Equality Act this year. Forty-seven thousand drivers with three or more drunk driving convictions are still on the road. Think about that as you drive home tonight. It's absurd. Let's change the law. Anyone convicted of drunk driving two times in three years should lose their license for five years. And three strikes and you're out and you are off the road, period. There's an old Italian expression, we grow too soon old and too late smart. For young drivers, a cell phone can be more dangerous than a bottle of alcohol. For teen drivers, texting while driving creates more fatal accidents than drinking while driving, believe it or not. 77% of young adults say that they can text and drive safely. They're wrong. Let's continue to crack down on texting while driving. If a teenager is caught texting while driving, they should lose their license for one year. Let them learn this lesson. They are our sons and our daughters, and let's save lives. I'd like to, at this time, recognize Ben Lieberman and his family. Ben and his family lost Evan, a 19-year-old who was killed in a car accident when the other person was texting and driving. They have taken that pain and turned it into a positive by being ferocious advocates to change these laws and inform teens He's been advocating all across the state and the country. Let's give Ben Lieberman a round of applause. Last year, I appointed a Moreland Commission to investigate public corruption. There's a disagreement about the need for more ethics reform. I understand that. The argument by some members of the legislature is that we created J. Cope and, and that should solve the problem. But there's been a string of bad acts almost on a daily basis. Open up the newspaper, even today, and you see more and more stories of individual legislators who have done bad acts. And it reflects poorly on all of us because people don't distinguish. It's an assemblyman, it's a senator, it's a Democrat, it's a Republican. It's just a politician. And it's just a state politician who works in state government. That's all they hear and that's all they know. And it reflects on all of us. So, well, it's, I didn't do it, it's not my problem. No, it is a problem for all of us, and it goes to the essence of what we are all trying to do. Ethics reform is an acknowledgment of the problem and an acknowledgment that we need to fix the system. Ethics reform says to the people of this state, yes, I saw the news articles too, and it bothers me, and I'm troubled by it. And we're going to pass ethics reform because we're going to change the system because we understand your concern that there seems to be a pattern of these repeated instances of bad acts. That's what ethics reform is. 
That's why I was arguing for ethics reform last year. And that's why I'm arguing for ethics reform this year. I propose a new anti-bribery anti and corruption laws, public financing of elections, independent enforcement at the Board of Elections, and disclosure of outside clients with business before the state. But I believe we must act. Why? Because when government has the public trust, government has the capacity to do good work. Some have suggested that suggesting the Moreland Commission or ethics reform suggests that I don't believe in the legislature. It actually is the exact opposite. I do believe in the legislature. I do believe in this. I do believe in us. I do believe in New York state government. I do believe in our capacity. And I don't want to see it limited. And government is limited by the lack of trust. And the more trust, the more capacity. This is working. We went through all the stats and all the statistics on the progress of the state. We have done what we said we were going to do. We've turned the state around. We're balancing budgets. We're working together. We put the politics aside. We come into the chamber. We're not Democrats. We're not Republicans. We're New Yorkers, and we're working for New York. And that is working. And we have accomplished great things. And I want to see us do even more together. And I believe the more trust we have from the public, the more we can do. I believe it's like fuel for a rocket. If we have the trust of the people and they're watching us perform and they're seeing this state move, then there's nothing we can't do. And I don't want to see any limit when we have so much more to do. Look at the agenda we outlined today. We have to rebuild this entire state after Sandy, Irene, and Lee with a whole new vision for resiliency and redundancy. We're going to invest in our schools like we've never done before. We're going to get the economy back. We're reforming the tax code. So much good work. But we need the public with us, and we need the public to trust us and believe in us. And that's what ethics reform is all about. And my last point is this. A few weeks ago, I found a situation that I actually found quite disturbing. And there was an article in the newspaper about a high school in Pine Bush, New York. And the article said that a group of parents, a group of Jewish parents, were bringing a lawsuit against the school because their children had been victims of anti-Semitism. Swastikas drawn in the school, anti-Semitic remarks, uh, throwing money at kids and making ugly, crude statements. This is in the high school. Uh, but really troubling, troubling actions and situations. I read the article and I called the State Education Department and no one had heard about it. I called the Division for Human Rights, and they hadn't heard about it. I called the state police, and they hadn't heard about it. This is despite the fact that when the news article was written, the lawsuit had been filed a year before, federal lawsuit filed a year before, and the complaints had gone on for five years, and no one knew about it. I want to propose a very simple law that gets to the heart of who we are. If a school official in the state of New York is aware of a pattern of racial or religious discrimination or harassment, that state official is under an affirmative duty to notify the state education department and the police, or that state official is no longer a state official because that's not who we are, and that's not how we perform.
And as we leave here today, let us recommit and remember what makes New York special and what makes us special as New Yorkers. New York is not about the buildings, and it's not about the land. What makes New York so special is the people, and it's how we treat each other. And it's what we have here, and it's what we have here. It's how we feel, and it's what we believe. And it's the premise of, that made this state the great state it was in the first place. And it's why the Pine Bush situation is so troubling to me. Because this state made a very loud and clear statement. This state said to the entire world, we are open for business. And we welcome everyone here to this great state of New York. That is the Statue of Liberty in the harbor. Come one, come all. We don't care the color of your skin. We don't care your religion. We don't care how much money you have in your pocket. You come to New York, and we will welcome you, and we will work with you, and we will invite you into the family of New York. And while other states, and while other states say we're afraid of diversity, while other states are building fences. We say we're excited by the diversity. We welcome the diversity. The diversity is what made us in the first place. And we believe we can take that diversity and we can take those differences and we can make one from those differences. We believe we can forge community from the people we welcome here. And the concept of community is we're all in this together, that there's a cord that connects you to you to you to you, and that cord weaves a fabric. And when one of us is raised, we're all raised, and when one of us is lowered, we're all lowered, because we're one, part of one community, and we're part of one fabric. And that's what made New York great, and that's what continues to make New York great, that at the end of the day, we are one. We are upstate, we are downstate, but we are one. We are Latino, we are African American, but we are one. We're New York City and we are Buffalo, but we are one. We are Democrat and Republican, but we are one. That is the promise of this great state. That is e pluribus unum, out of many, one. It's the founding premise, the enduring promise. It's the promise that we inherited from our parents and the promise of New York that we're going to pass on to our children and the promise, my friends, that we are going to make a reality in this great state working together. Thank you and God bless you and let's have a great 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the Governor's 2014 State of the State Address. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great year.